So, um, you know, one of my very good friends is Pastor Kevin McBride over at the Raymond Baptist Church. And, uh, you know, we, we love each other and we're always clowning around with each other. So at Rotary this past week, I told this little story. I said, listen, I said, there, there was this wonderful elderly couple and they were Baptist. And, uh, but they were both widowers, but they had fallen in love with each other, but they both died before they could get married. And so when they got to heaven, they met St. Peter at the gates, and, uh, and they said, you know, we really want to get married. And Peter said, listen, you're talking about eternity. No rush here. Why don't you wait 50 years, come back and see me in 50 years, and we'll see what we can do. So 50 years later, in this sweet old couple, they come back to Peter, and they said, yes, we really do want to get married. And Peter said, listen, eternity here. No rush. Give it another 50 years. Come back and see me, and then we'll, we'll make sure we'll do it. And so, you know, 50 more years. Now, 100 years later, they come back to St. Peter, and they're like, yeah, we really do want to get married. And Peter's like, listen, listen, give me another 50 years. And if I can't find a Baptist pastor by then, I'll marry you myself. <laughs> oh. To which Pastor Kevin informed me that the reason we can't see Baptist pastors is because they're that close to God and we just can't <laughs> see them. So we do, we do have a lot of fun. So um, this, this is, um, you know, we've we, we got Christmas behind us, we've got New Year's uh, in front of us and uh, um, getting ready to start a new year. And so I wanted to share a message with you this morning on uh, six questions that you should ask yourself. Six questions that you should ask yourself, especially as we're going into a new year here in just a few days. So the first question is very, very important, and it is this. Do the people that you love know it? Do the people you love know it? Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 says this, love never fails. And, of course, there's a lot more in that chapter that deals with the subject of love. But love never fails. And, you know, that's so true. Love never fails. And love is a tremendous gift. Somebody once said that love is like a garden. You know, you, you cultivate it with faithfulness and commitment and determination and, you know, the long haul. But like a garden, it can grow weeds. And it can grow the weeds of discontentment or suspicion, and especially misunderstanding, because we have an incredible propensity to miscommunicate how we feel or what we're thinking. And, you know, the human language is so frail that so many times there's huge areas of misunderstanding. And, uh, and so you need to pull those weeds regularly in that garden of love. And you need to be able to communicate to the ones that you love that you love them. And so getting ready to go into 2016, do the people that you love know know that you love them. Have you really communicated that? And let me just say this, because a lot of people feel like, oh, I've got all kinds of time to do that. You know what? You never know. You never know. When my brother was a firefighter down in Sarasota, Florida, he was also an EMT, and they got a call one day, and uh, him and the other EMT in the ambulance, you know, rushed to the scene, and uh, what had happened is that a husband and wife, a young couple in their 30s, uh, they had gotten into a huge argument and they were in the kitchen arguing and, you know, really raising their voices at each other. And she just got dizzy, her eyes rolled, and she collapsed. And they got there as EMTs, and the first thing that they were thinking is that this is an overdose. She was unresponsive, and my, my brother just said, do you think it could be a brain bleed? And, you know, they didn't know, but they got her stabilized, they rushed her to the hospital, and she never recovered. She died that night. And the husband was absolutely mortified because the last communication he had with his wife was in the form of an argument. And, uh, and she drifted off into eternity on the heels of an argument. So you know what? You never know if you've got that time that you think you have. So as you get ready to go into 2016, how about we make a little commitment right here this morning and, t and just tell ourselves that, you know what, I'm going to make an effort, I'm going to make an endeavor to let those people who I love know that I love them. You know what, it's the easiest thing in the world to do because it only costs you three little words. I love you. It's the easiest thing. And it's 
free. I mean, there's no cost to it. It doesn't cost you anything. And it removes all doubt from the other people's minds. Because sometimes people really question that. You know what the Bible says in Proverbs? It says, better is an open rebuke than love that is concealed. And let's face it, nobody likes an open rebuke, right? Nobody likes to, in public, be reprimanded or be criticized or be put in your place openly. Nobody loves that. But the Bible says that's better than if somebody loves you but never reveals that to you or never discloses it to you. So let's just make that a a, a thing going into 2016 that the people that are are closest to me, the people that I love, I want to make sure that I communicate to that, that I know them. I don't know how many times especially men because you know we live in a culture where you know men are supposed to be rough and gruff and they never show emotions and men never communicate to their sons that they that they love them i was with a group of ministers once and um uh uh, i i I just did a coaching this is a team building exercise actually and uh, what it is is you ask yourself a couple of questions you say um uh where were you born uh what was the number of siblings in your family and what was the most difficult challenge you had growing up? And when I asked this group of ministers, um, every single one of them, every single one of them had issues with their dad. Either their dad died when they were really young, or their dad wasn't a, an outward, you know, affectionate person. And they just never knew from their dad that they... And, you know, this is one of the blessings. When you go into the Old Testament, it, it was very heavy responsibility on the shoulders of the father, the patriarch, to extend that blessing down to the children. That I love you, I'm proud of you. Uh, you know, I appreciate you, I value you. That's so important. And when we stop and think about our Heavenly Father... Wasn't he the one who demonstrated with the most extravagant demonstration of all when Jesus goes to the cross? In this is the love of God, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent Jesus to be the propitiation for our sins. I once heard somebody say, you know, I asked God, how much does he love me? And Jesus went, this much as he was crucified on the cross. So God never withheld his demonstration of affection and of love towards us. How much more should we be able to communicate that to those around us? So the first question is, do the people around you know that you love them? The second question is also very, very important, and that is this. Am I, as an individual, sensitive to the Holy Spirit? Am I sensitive to love? This is so important. Jesus said in John 14, 16, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. You know, so many people say, boy, if I could go back in time, I'd want to go back when Jesus walked the earth. I'd just love to see him. But Jesus said, listen, I'm going to pray. The Father's going to send you another helper. And that word in the Greek, another, is so important because it means one exactly like so it's not like another kind of different, you know, like, you know, here's, here's one meal, but here's another one. You know, this is Chinese, this is Italian, this is whatever, McDonald's, you know. And so it, it's one exactly like. Jesus is saying the Father's going to send you one exactly like me because he's the third person of the Godhead, and that means he's of the very same essence, the very same substance, the very same character, the very same qualities, the very same attributes, and the Holy Spirit is going to be with you forever. Because let's face it, when we think we feel Jesus, we're really feeling the Holy Spirit because Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven right now. And the Holy Spirit is the one that's in the earth today and in the world today. And so am I being really sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit? Jesus goes on in verse 26 and he says, The Helper, the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and he will bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. So how important is this? Listen, when you think you feel or when you think you hear the voice of God, It's the voice of the Holy Spirit that you're hearing. I always tell people, I say, the more of the Scriptures you know, the more vocabulary you are giving the Holy Spirit to which to speak to you. Because He's going to speak to you through the Word of God. And and so He brings these Scriptures back to your mind, and He helps you. You see, here's the truth. You can't live for Jesus in this world without the power of the Holy Spirit. 
You just can't. The Holy Spirit is the one that lifts Jesus up and glorifies Him. The Holy Spirit is the one that helps us stay in a tight relationship. And so you can't live for Jesus outside of the power of the Holy Spirit. And at some point going into the new uh, year, I want to do a series on the Holy Spirit so that we understand the importance of this person of the Trinity, this Godhead, the, the power and the person of the Holy Spirit. But real quickly, just a couple of scriptures that talk about the blessings. One is, is peace. You know, Romans 14, 17, the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And so you ask yourself, well, how important is peace? Well, look at how crazy the world is right now. Right? And it's getting crazier, it seems like. And so peace is extremely important. I mean, there are wealthy people that would probably give anything they own in order to have inner peace and tranquility. And the Holy Spirit is the one that blesses us with supernatural peace. Jesus said, listen, I'm going to give you peace, but it's not like anything the world gives you. It's not going to be superficial. It's not going to be based on circumstances. It's going to be something more that's an anchor of the soul. It's going to be something internally that wells inside of you and keeps you through the storms of life because life throws storms at you. I mean, we've been seeing horrible twisters and, and tornadoes you know, in the south and in the west right now that, that are claiming lives, and, and life is like that. Out of nowhere, a cyclone comes and a storm hits you, and isn't it wonderful to have peace? in the middle of anything that the world can throw at you. And where does that come? It comes from the presence of the Holy Spirit. And here's another one, Romans 16, 11. He will make, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Psalms 16, 11. He will make known to you the paths of life. Here's that guidance that comes from him. And he says, in your presence is the fullness of joy. And in your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. So here again, he's going to give us outward joy. We should be joyful people. We should be happy people. We should be content people. Paul says, listen, I've learned to be content whether I have a bunch or whether I have nothing because my contentment comes from the relationship I have with God through the person of the Holy Spirit. And he says, in your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. How many times do we get into the problem of sin because we're looking for pleasure? Right? The, 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 uh, the Bible says that sin has pleasure for a season. It seems to pacify you or satiate you, but then it ends into bondage. It ends into death. It ends into destruction. But in the presence of God and through the power of the Holy Spirit, he says, I will bring pleasure into your life that will be a good pleasure, that will be a holy pleasure. I remember, you know, and again, I mean, I, come out of a, uh, I came out of a background of, of uh, heavy drug usage and, and all that kind of stuff, and I remember the first time that the Holy Spirit came on me, I was like, that was a feeling, an experience that no drug on earth could ever give me, and it was clean. It was holy. There was no like letting down and then feeling discouraged and needing another hit or needing another fix. You know, it was good. And so God is good. And here's the presence of the Holy Spirit. And then another aspect of the Holy Spirit in your life is favor. This is out of the book of Action. It's talking about the Holy Spirit resting on the church and it says they were praising God and having favor with all of the people and the lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved this is so important not only for us as individuals but us corporately as a church to have the favor of god on us because that's where god begins to add and multiply and bring people in because they sense the favor of god listen there's nothing more important in your life getting ready to go into 2016 as having the favor of god on your life there's nothing worth that. There's nothing that can be traded for that or you know, given up for that. Favor is so important that God's favor is upon you. The early church had that favor, and you and I want to be able to have that favor as well. So do people around us that we love, do they know that we love us? Secondly, am I being sensitive to the presence of the Holy Spirit, the voice of God, the leading of God? Am I being present to that? And thirdly is... Um, do I know my purpose? Um, man, do you know what your purpose is in life? You know, this is so important. Jeremiah the prophet said, uh, speaking as God for God, I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare, not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. The Bible says that God has plans for your life. 
The fact that God designed you, the fact that God thought of you, you know, you weren't just an accident, you just didn't become you because of the normal, you know, being born and then I just developed because of the genes that were in me and because of the experiences that I had and the family that I was born in. No, God made you you because he wanted you and he has a perfect place have you ever seen one of these like five thousand piece jigsaw puzzles you know and and like there's one missing and and god has that place where you fit into the body of christ he's got a purpose for your existence a purpose for your being and you know you just need to ask yourself do i know what that is i mean am i really seeking after that am i asking god god what is my purpose what is my plan where do i fit in because self-worth and inner fulfillment is directly linked to your purpose in god's plan and you know it doesn't have to be some extravagant thing you know i'm not going to become an amy carmichael and go and reach all the orphans in in india it might be something that you would think well this is just kind of small and insignificant but for god it's part of the the puzzle it's part of where you belong you know statistics say that 80 percent of americans are dissatisfied with their job think about that 80 percent are dissatisfied with their job and you know because a job in itself is not necessarily fulfilling it's not necessarily giving us our identity because it's not necessarily based within the kingdom of god god gives us a vocation but then god gives us a calling and this is becoming proven again and again when we look at the you know uh, when we look at the Uh, people who started ibm or or pc and when we look at steve jobs with apple and when we look at the young man that created facebook one of the things that these entrepreneurs are all doing is i mean they're like insanely wealthy but now they're starting to give to charities and give to foundations because they realize that the true blessing isn't in getting 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 it's in blessing back it's giving back and so these people are like just you know cutting loose of their insane wealth and giving it to foundations and doing so much good with the money that they've accumulated and that's the same with us it's like we've got to become givers back to the things of god of the kingdom of god because no one else here has your assignment It's your assignment, and no one else has it. Now, somebody might have to pick up the slack and step into that role of responsibility and pick up the slack, but that's your job. And so when I look at the ministries here at New Life Church, when I look at all the things we do, you know, we've got Kids Zone, ministering to kids, and they're always asking for help. What, you know, how big of a a commitment would that be to say, well, you know, once a month I'll get involved, I'll help out. We've got a wonderful visitation program or or our, our greeter program, our welcoming team. We've got the Bridges Ministry with uh, Craig and Carrie Carson, you know, reaching out. And, and you know what, that, that goes back to the favor of the Lord, giving us favor in the eyes of the community because we're blessing them. We're bringing them things. We're blessing them. Just last week, we blessed every single police officer with a law enforcement Bible that had their name and scrolled in it with their badge number on it. Every single police officer in Raymond got one. And, uh, and they're, just, they're just delighted with that. The chief was saying, man, what a great hit. They, they really all appreciate that. We're just blessing and getting favor back from it so that when they see me on the road, they don't give me tickets. <laughs> so, not saying that there aren't arterial, arterial motives here. So, uh, <laughs> um, but you know, there's so many ministries. There's so many ministries. You know, um, a few years ago, I got involved in Rotary because I was thinking, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in this Christian bubble of ministry. I'm always in the church dealing with Christians. And I thought, you know, I want to get outside into the community. So I joined Rotary and um, found out eventually that the people who started Ro- Rotary were believers. Because I was like, you know, I'm hearing and seeing too many things here in this Rotary Foundation. Their motto is service above self. And then finally, one day, somebody did a a little presentation on the history of Rotary, and sure enough, the guy that uh, created Rotary was a Christian businessman. And they started it. There's a four-way test that says, is it the truth? Is it beneficial to all involved? Does it bring goodwill to, you know, all these different things. And I'm like, man, there's got to be something of faith behind the scenes here. And sure enough, it was. And so, you know, do, do I know where I fit in? Do I know what my purpose is? Am I seeking that? And I want to challenge you as we go into 2016, find where your niche is. 
Find where you can give back and serve. Is it on the welcoming team? Is it with Kid Zone? Is it on the worship team? We need so much help in every area, and uh, and so many of you already do a lot. And I thank God. You know, there's a lot of people that get involved in this church, and I'm very thankful for that. But find out where your niche is. Find out where you can be giving back to the Lord through service, an area of ministry. And then number four is, and this again, so important, uh, do the people I love know it? Am I sensitive to the Holy Spirit? Do I know my purpose? And then going into 2016, am I inviting people to church? Um, Again, this is so important. In Mark chapter 16, Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Uh, This isn't a suggestion. This isn't a when you feel good about it. This is a dictate of the Lord. This is called the Great Commission. Jesus commissions the church. What did Jesus say? As the Father sends me, so I send you. And so are you inviting people right outside the front doors on this little table? We have these You Are Invited cards. I have some in my wallet right now. And wherever I go, I try to hand these out. If I talk to somebody, if I meet somebody new, I'll give them a little You Are Invited card and I'll say, hey, listen, if you get a chance, stop by and visit us at church. And I've kind of set a little personal goal in 2016 that I want to give away way one a week at least one a week and i'm challenging all the leadership to do the same thing and i would challenge you too how hard is it and then that way they have a little card in their possession to remind them that you know hey and i don't know how many people i talk to and they're like well you know i really should get back to church and it's been a long time i should be in church and so you're always inviting them i think the statistic is something like 85 percent of people in church came to church because somebody invited them 80% of people who give their lives to Christ do it because somebody invited them to a church service. And so, am I inviting people to church? The world clock says that every 60 minutes, 7,000 people go into eternity. Think about that. In the time that we're here, almost 10,000 people will go into eternity. 10,000. And that's the population of Raymond. Every hour, 7,000 people are going into eternity. And so this isn't a suggestion. This is the great commission that we do this because, you see, every single person is going to go either into heaven or hell. It's just that simple. And when we look into the eyes of people, we have to look, look at them in a different way and say, these are eternal beings that will spend eternity either in the presence of God or separated forever from God. Jesus said this, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus is all about the unsaved. Jesus is all about the lost and reaching them. Is there a more important message for the world today than Jesus loves you, he died for you, and that you can be saved, that you don't have to go to hell. Do we really believe that even in our own hearts? You know, one of the reasons Mahatma Gandhi didn't become a Christian is he said, because if I really believed the message of Christianity, I would wear my legs down to bloody stumps telling the world how to be right with God through Jesus Christ. That's how, that's how important this, this whole concept of sharing the message of Christ is to other people. Um, many will never hear the message if they don't hear it through you. And this is probably part of that purpose that God has for you. God is going to intersect your life all through the journey of your life with people that will intersect your paths, that will cross your paths, that won't cross my paths, or maybe other people's paths, but they'll cross your path. And you're the one to be able to bring that smile and just say, hey, you know what? I gave my life to Christ, totally changed my life. And he loves you too. Or, hey, you know what? Here's a you are invited card. If you get a chance, I'd love to have you come to church. As a matter of fact, I'll meet you at the front doors. I'll come and pick you up if you need a ride. Whatever it is, and do that. And then you know what the most important thing is? Expect results. Don't just do it and say, well, you know, I'm just doing this because pastor says so. No, expect, re- expect people to respond positively because you're going to wear that on your face. If you don't expect people are going to respond positively, you're going to wear that on your face. And they're going to feel that. They're going to sense that. Um, and so, so be positive about it. Expect results. 
and invite people to church. So, so, so important. Number five, man, I can't underscore this one enough. Am I pursuing wisdom? You know, the Bible says that ignorance is deadly. The Bible says, God says, my people perish from a lack of knowledge. When they don't know the principles of how the kingdom of God works, uh, people perish. And one of the things that you see when you look at the greatest men or the greatest women of history is that exclusively they were men and women of wisdom. They had great wisdom. I remember seeing uh, a few months ago, I saw this little interview with Ben Carson, and they were saying, you know, you're a doctor. What do you know of politics? How do you feel that you could be a president of the United States and be in politics? And Ben Carson said, leadership is not about politics, it's about wisdom. And I thought, man, he hit the nail on the head. It's about having wisdom. It's about knowing what to do and when to do it. And that is a gift. That isn't something that you just learn or gleam. I mean, you know, some of that comes from that. uh, But it's a gift of God. James says, listen, whoever lacks wisdom, let them ask of God. Because wisdom is something that belongs to God. God is all wise. And so God distills that wisdom to us when we ask. One of the prayers that I pray the most in my life is, God, give me wisdom. I stopped praying for good looks because I got that years ago, and so I just said, God, I need wisdom now, you know, and just, you know, help me with that. And, and you know, I, hey, listen, I go to a hospital visit while I'm traveling in the elevator. I am praying, God, give me wisdom. God, give me wisdom. And uh, sometimes the phone rings and I pick it up and some, right off the bat I hear somebody distressed or you know, they're hurting and, and immediately as I'm listening I'm like, God give me wisdom. I need wisdom. Something happens in the church and I need wisdom all the time. And it doesn't mean that I haven't blown it, it doesn't mean that I haven't missed it, but, but I keep asking for more and more wisdom. This is something that's a gift that God gives us. Look what the Bible says in Proverbs 3, how blessed is the man who finds wisdom wisdom and the man who gains understanding you see we always talk about faith the most important thing is faith but listen wisdom is so important i need to have wisdom it goes on and says in proverbs 4 the beginning of wisdom is acquire wisdom with all of your acquiring get understanding the first sign of a wise person is seeking more wisdom You say, well, how do I know if I'm going to be wise? Begin to seek wisdom. Begin to ask for wisdom. Cry out to God. God, I need your wisdom right now. I need you to impart my life. You know, how many times do we get ourselves in trouble because we make poor decisions? We make bad decisions. We make bad decisions in relationships. We make bad decisions with finances. We make bad decisions with moves. We make all kinds of bad decisions. How much more should we say, God, I need wisdom in order to make right decisions. I need wisdom in my life. And so the beginning of wisdom is acquire wisdom. Look at some of the prophets here. First of all is prophet. Look what it says. Her prophet is better than the prophet of silver, and better than that of fine gold. Now, I mean, listen, let's, let's face it. This is the, the uh, equation of finances. This is economy he's talking about. Silver and gold are the bedrock of economy. And yet he's saying wisdom is better than that. It's better than that. And then he goes on and he says long life. In Proverbs 3, he says long life are in her right hand. Um, You know, there was a song, Only the Good Die Young. Well, that's not necessarily true according to Scripture. The good don't die young. The good seek wisdom and have long life. And so, you know, how many people say, oh, I want to have a long life. I want longevity. The Bible promises us longevity. And he says that's one of the blessings of pursuing wisdom and seeking wisdom and having that part of your life. And you say, well, you know, I know it says that wisdom's better than gold, but, you know, it'd be nice to have some of that stuff. Well, you know what it says? When you seek wisdom, in her left hand are what? Riches and honor. There are some people that have riches and don't have honor. They have riches and they have dishonor because of the way they got their riches. And so here it says that wisdom will bring you all these things. Another one, another blessing that wisdom brings is peace. 
Her ways are pleasant ways, and all her paths are peace. So again, if I go into 2016 saying, you know what, I'm going to seek wisdom. I'm going to ask God for wisdom that I make better choices. It's going to bring peace into my life because there's nothing more peaceful than knowing that you're making good choices. That you're making choices based on God's economy and God's kingdom. And then also happiness. She is a tree of life to those who take hold of her, and happy are all who hold her fast. When you start living a life out of wisdom, your life is going to be happy. Because you're not going to be stepping on all those mines out there in the minefields. You're not going to get snared in all of the traps of the enemy. Another one, Ecclesiastes 7, is protection. For wisdom is protection just as money is protection. But the advantage of knowledge is that uh, wisdom persevere, uh, pres- preserves the lives of its possessors. And so here, um, wisdom is a-, a form of protection in your life. Not going to make bad choices. You know, for those of you that are young people in here, let me just say something. More than anyone else, you need to pray for wisdom. Because science tells us, neurology tells us, that the prefrontal cortex of the mind does not fully develop until your mid-20s. The prefrontal cortex of your mind is the part that connects cause and effect. That's why we say young people feel like they'll never get hurt or never get in trouble. And you see young people doing the most stupidest things. You know, like, I'm going to jump off this five-story building and see if I can land in a bucket of water. You know, the crazy, crazy things. And you're like, don't you understand cause and effect? Don't you understand if you do that, that this can... No, they don't. That's why I can go out and drink a bunch of beer and get behind the wheel of my car because they don't understand. You're now impaired. And if you're impaired, you're probably going to crash. And if you crash, you could take somebody else's life. So... Young people, more than anything else, you should also pray for wisdom because it's not going to come from experience. It's not going to come from hard lessons learned in life because you haven't learned those yet. But you can even pray, God, you know what? Even though neuroscience says that the prefrontal cortex isn't developed and I don't fully understand cause and effect, I can ask you for wisdom and supernaturally you'll guide me through those things that I won't understand naturally. So seek wisdom. Pray and ask God regularly for wisdom. And then the last blessing it brings is stability. Isaiah 33, He will be the stability of your times, a wealth of salvation, wisdom and knowledge. The fear of the Lord is His treasure. So the fear of the Lord, it says, is the beginning of wisdom. And it's stability into your life. It doesn't mean that God's not going to give you adventure and excitement. Boy, just the opposite is true. If you really live the Christian life, it is the most exciting, adventurous lifestyle ever out there. But it all comes from having wisdom. So, so important that that we understand that. So, So here it is. Do the people I love know it? Am I going to go into 2016 and keep things disclosed? Or am I going to like really just begin to let people know that I love them? That is so important. Am I going to become sensitive to the Holy Spirit? to the voice of God in my life. I need that. Am I going to seek to understand my purpose? You know, even Tom Brady said there's got to be something more to life than playing football. Isn't that something? Probably the most winningest, bestest, most awesome, totally cool quarterback. In the world. <laughs> I'm watching Ray roll his eyes over there. You know, he, He's a Steelers fan, but thank God there's forgiveness. And, you know, so... But I mean, here's a person that's really successful in his field, and he's saying, this field can't be all there is to life. And the answer is no. <laughs> There's so much more. Do I know my purpose in life? Uh, am, I, am I inviting people to church or to an experience with Christ? Am I pursuing wisdom? Uh, so important. And lastly, number six, am I ready? Should I die today? You know, there's only one thing that makes you ready, and that is being right with God. The statistic is is that 10 out of 10 people are going to die. You can't escape it. You can't deny it. You can't say it's a lie. Uh, you, You can't be ignorant about it. Every single person is going to die. And this is what Jesus said. For what will it profit a man if he gains the entire world and forfeits his soul? What can a man give in exchange for his soul? That's a great question. 
I have fallen madly in love with Patuckaway Park. I, I go hiking, and, and every time I go out there, I see something new. I find a new rock formation. I just, I lo- and I, I'm like, it's mine. I tell people that I hike with now, you know, respect my park. I mean, it's mine. Um, Patuck in, 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 in the Indian language is Ken's Park. That's what it means. <laughs> in, in case you didn't know that dialect of Indian, that's what it means. And, 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 and you know, you start thinking about it. It's like Patuckaway is 2,500 acres on a globe that is magnanimous. And it's like, wow, how cool would it be to own the whole world? That means, you know, that means that the Grand Canyon would be mine and Niagara Falls would be mine and the pyramids would be mine. And, and Jesus is saying, listen, what would it profit you if you really did have the whole world and you lose your soul? Let's ask that a different way. What do you think people in hell would give to get out. When they go back and assess their life and look at the values of their life and look at the things that they thought were important, what do you think that they would go back and give up to gain heaven? Well, the answer to that is absolutely everything. There isn't anything that they wouldn't give or sacrifice to gain the the, the security of their own eternal soul. I often ask a question, you know, people say, well, there's no hell. Well, if there is no hell, then why do so, pe- so many people that are not believers die in abject fear? Why do they go out kicking and screaming and filled with fear? Because even something deep inside of our guts say, you know, there is something of a just God out there. Jesus said this in Luke chapter 12. He said, I will say to my soul, this is a guy that, you know, he's just got it all. And he says, I'm going to say to my soul, soul, you have plenty of goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your soul is required of you. And now who will own what you have prepared? Think about that. This guy is so wealthy that he's like, you know what, I saw I retire at 30 or whatever it might be. I'm done. You know, I'm just going to live and enjoy and squander and just... This guy obviously thinks he's got a lot longer to enjoy life. And God says, dude, you don't have any more time to enjoy life because your soul is required of you this night. God leaves the preparation of our leaving this life in our hands. God says it's up to you to prepare for the next life. I'm not doing that for you. It's up to you. It's more important than anything else. It's more important than your driver's license, than your education, than who you're going to marry or where you're going to live. It's are you ready to launch from launch pad earth? Are you ready to go into that next life? Are you ready for that? Are you ready to die what an incredible question and then we look at the promises of god for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son this is the season that we just celebrated the birth of jesus that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life God loves so much that he gave heaven's best. And here's that whole heart of a giving God. So that whoever believes, and there's the choice. See, God says, I set before you life and death. But the choice is yours. Choose life. You see, God is pro-choice. And he says, choose life. Because he's definitely pro-life. And he says, I've given you an incredible gift. You didn't come into this all by yourself. You didn't just will yourself into existence. God is the one that brought you here. God is the one that says, listen, I've given you. Right now, you are experiencing something. You're sitting there, you're listening to me, but you're breathing and your heart is beating and you're experiencing something called life. And it's temporary. God says it's going to end 10 out of 10, 100% guaranteed. And he says the preparation of where you go as you exit this life is left into your hands. You have to believe. And Jesus says this, all that the Father has given me will come to me, 
and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. Isn't that good news? See, this is why we believe in a God that is immutable. He doesn't change. Because if God was a God that changes, then even though He said this a couple thousand years ago, how would we know that He still means it today? Well, because He is immutable. The Bible says there's no shifting shadows, there's no variances with God. God doesn't change. This is a 100% guarantee that those who come to Him in faith and say, Jesus, I am trusting You that what You did on the cross 2,000 years ago is the only way I can experience everlasting life. And when I put my confidence in that, my faith in that, the power of the Word of God is such that there's no demon in hell, there's no person on earth, that can stop the reality of these verses becoming truth in your life. Nothing can stop a person when they come to Jesus and say, Jesus, I'm a sinner, and I ask you to cleanse me and to wash me. I believe that you're my God, that you died for me, and all of a sudden, I am born again. And there's not a demon in hell. There's not even the devil himself that is big enough, strong enough, bad enough that can negate the promises of God's Word, because God says, I watch over my Word to perform it. And He says, I will certainly not cast you out. You know, it doesn't, so, so, so here you are over here, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're gay. It doesn't matter if you're a thief. It doesn't matter if you're proud. It doesn't matter even if you're a good person in your own goodness. But when you recognize his gift, and you come to him, he's not going to say, mm, no, not you. I mean, I know I let these other 3,000 people go by, but not you. Not today, not now. No, he says, no. You come to me on my terms, and I will accept you. And it's so simple that people trip over it because it's his terms, and we are so proud that we want to make it our terms. God, I'll come to you on my terms. And he's like, no, no, that doesn't work at all. That's exactly what we learned from Cain and Abel. Abel came to me on my terms. Cain wanted to come to me on his terms. And it didn't work out well at all. You've got to come on my terms. You've got to come through the cross of Christ. There is no other way. That is the narrow gate that leads to life. And so, you know, you've all seen that commercial, what's in your wallet? Well, God would ask, what's in your heart? What's in your heart? Because if faith is in your heart, heaven opens wide. And if heaven opens wide, then I can have the ability to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. I can have the ability to pray for favor and pray for wisdom. I can have the ability to find out what my purpose is in life. All of these pieces of this puzzle start connecting and making sense. Let's pray. I want you to just close your eyes and bow your heads just for a moment this morning. I don't know who you are, what brings you here today, whether you're right with God or not, but that really is the most important question. Are you ready should you die today? And maybe you're here today and God is really speaking to your heart and you're understanding that the choice because of God's incredible free gift of free will, the choice is yours. What a loving God that humbles himself, doesn't demand, doesn't manipulate, doesn't force, but rather says, I love you so much that it's got to be a choice from you to follow me. And maybe you're here this morning and you're like, Pastor, it's all making sense for the first time in my life. And I want to give my life to Christ right now, today. If that's you, heads are bowed and eyes are closed, but if that's you and you say, Pastor, would you pray for me? I want to give my life to Jesus Christ today. Would you just raise your hand where I can see it? No one's looking around, but you could put your hand up and say, Pastor, would you pray for me? I want to know that I am ready should I die today because of faith in Christ. It's your one this morning. Pastor, pray for me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we, we thank you that 
we get these little reprieves in life, and one of them is January 1st, where we can kind of convince ourselves that there's a new year starting, there's a new page, there's a clean slate. And Lord, I pray that as we go into this year, that we would ask ourselves these questions. Do the people that I love know it? Am I really being sensitive to the Holy Spirit? Do I know my purpose in your economy? Am I inviting other people to this great truth that I've discovered? Am I pursuing wisdom? And am I ready? Should I die today? Such important questions. God, may these answers to these questions lay out the path for us for 2016 because I feel in my heart and in my spirit that it is going to be a tremendous year, an awesome year to be a believer and to live for you. Father, I pray that you bless this congregation in a mighty way. Lord, I pray that you bless these candidates that are saying yes to Jesus and even to the public acknowledgement of being baptized in water as a follower of Christ, that it would be meaningful to them and it would be a great platform from which to launch 2016 from. And we all say yes to you and give you the glory for our lives. In Jesus' name, and everyone said amen and amen and amen. Hey.